Well, hello, everybody. Um, glad you're here today. And uh, we will continue our discussions afterwards. Glad to talk with you all on some of these subjects. And uh, just uh, happy to be here and, you know, be able to teach uh, and have this kind of fellowship. Also, welcome those who are on live stream. Appreciate you being here as well. Well, today we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'll start out with verse 1. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy, for I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. You know, sometimes it's better, as we started to look at last week, not to over grieve those we wish to help. That's something to always be careful about. We certainly know that principle in dealing with our children. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Colossians 3, 21 says, fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. So we know that principle already. And Paul doesn't want to discourage his children in the Lord by rebuking them further even though they needed to heed Paul's warnings to them. So the principle that holds true for earthly fathers is also applicable to rebuke within the church. We have to be careful of rebuke, especially to unbelievers, because they cannot understand rebuke without the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 9 eight: do not rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Matthew 7, 6, don't give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then tear, turn and tear you to pieces. I have thought long and hard on that one, and I've used it before. you got to be careful, especially with false teachers. Boy, they'll trample you down in a big hurry if you're not careful. But you know what? We're called to employ rebuke where it's warranted in the church. Titus 1.13, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. Luke 17.3, so watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Oh, well, that's the part that we often don't go that far. We don't need to hold grudges against people. We need, if they've really repented, we need to reconfirm them and befriend them and extend our love to them. <clears throat> We're to watch ourselves and the way in which we give rebuke to brothers in Christ. We are to first tell the truth in love. That's Ephesians 4.15. Then we're also to give the Lord time to work in the lives of born-again believers, as Paul was giving the Corinthian Christians. We need to be careful to allow the Lord to lead us to when is the right time to rebuke people and when is the right time to wait and pray. There's a time for everything. As teachers, we can continue to teach them and train them, but the Lord will show us the right time to bring sharp rebuke. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth with many tears, not in judgment, but in love. He was telling the truth in love. True love for a fellow believer is to tell them the truth in love. If they're wandering, it's not love to let them continue down, down the wrong road. We may be one, the only person who can help them. Only the Lord knows. But when he gives us opportunity, we better take it. This is especially true today when we live in an age of a lack of biblical discernment. Let's look at the subject of forgiveness of the sinner. 
verse 5, if anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. Satan can outwit people who don't really forgive. For we are not unaware of his schemes. We need to be aware of the schemes of the enemy. And that's one of them. To cause people to hold a grudge. Christians. This uh, passage was obviously talking about the man who Paul had commanded them to disfellowship for having a sexual affair with his mother. mother. A horrible thing. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 6, it's actually reported that there's a sexual uh, immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among the pagans. A man has his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit. And I've already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you're assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I'm with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand the man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature uh, may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Of course, yeast is a picture of what a bad or good influence, most times in the Bible it's bad influence, can do to a church. But time had passed and the man who was disfellowshipped and handed over to Satan had evidently repented and returned to Christ. When someone has sinned and been thrown out of fellowship, we are to restore them just like we do not want to overly grieve someone by rebuking them over and over again. We're to affirm our love for them if they have truly repented and accept them back into fellowship. That doesn't mean we put them back into a position of leadership in the church, though. It means they are to be restored to fellowship and are to obey the Lord. Paul gives a basis for forgiving someone who sins against us personally or against our brothers and sisters in the church. And I covered this in my uh, book that I, that's called Lessons in Forgiveness. It's a Bible study. Very important one, by the way. The following is what I wrote about the, the, the passage 2 Corinthians 2.10. We must be especially quick to forgive our brothers who repent. If others in the church forgive people, we are also to forgive them. We are not to hold against them forever what they've done in the past. We must lay that down and wipe the slate clean. That's what the Lord does for us. This usually means that person must be restored over time. A person who has sinned must not be immediately put back into leadership in the church. He must be restored to fellowship but they must also be disciplined, thus discipled, and observed over time to be sure they're not falling back into the same lifestyle sin. We are to forgive because we don't want the enemy to gain a foothold in the churches and in individual Christians. Some of the devices of Satan, of which we are to be, uh, be aware, are these. He tempts us to disobedience, Genesis 3, 4 through 5. He wants, Satan's, he wants saints to slander God, Job 1, 9 through 11. He removes the good seed, and 13, 19. He sows tares among the wheat, Matthew 13, 38. 
He promotes he promotes lying, lust, and murder, John 8, 44. He produces false miracles, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, in order to deceive. He inflames uh, un, unrelenting anger, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. And he wants us to be unforgiving, 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance, grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's Colossians 3.13. Be kind and compassionate to one another, uh, forgiving each other, just as, uh, as, as in Christ God forgave you, Ephesians 4.32. Our model is Christ. He forgave our sins when we were still sinners. But when we repented of sin, he forgave us. Whenever we sin, if we confess our sins, he will forgive them. We need to have the same attitude of forgiveness. We need to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. And that's the pattern of a true believer. If we harbor unforgiveness for our brothers in the Lord, then we're not living a Christ-like life. Our brother's sins become sin for us and may cause us to commit the sins of slander and gossip, which end in malice, revenge, and hatred. A good example from the Bible of forgiveness is found in the story of Joseph. Joseph had been sinned against by his brothers, yet he forgave them and restored them after testing them. That's a good model for the church in the case of someone who sins against another believer or the whole church. And that's from my book, Lessons in Forgiveness. He moves on to uh, a section called Ministers of the New Covenant. Verse 12, now, that, now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened the door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. You know, Paul was not a loner, though he was not afraid to stand alone in his stand for the truth. But we all need fellowship, and Paul was the same as we are. Paul worked with others to preach and teach. He worked with Barnabas, John, Mark, and Silas. Then Barnabas took John, Mark, and went to Cyprus, Acts 15.39. And Paul took Silas and went on to Syria and Cilicia, Acts 15, 41. Later, he worked with Timothy, Titus, and many others. Paul was not prepared to preach the gospel in Troas without the aid of Titus. So he moved on to Macedonia. Paul likely had no peace of mind, not only because of the absence of Titus, but also because of the situation in Corinth. Verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to, uh, we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Did you know that you're a pleasing smell to God? If you're truly serving him, you're like incense. You're like the smell of a wonderful steak on the barbecue. Not only that, but uh, the aroma, the presence of Christians is a sweet smell to those who are dying in their sins and want to believe and repent. You are the smell of death to a person who does not want to believe, but to another, you are a wonderful smell. Speaking of smells, <laughs> one time I went to the dump on Oahu. I had some really heavy stuff. The dump, so I had to get out of my van and carry the heavy stuff over to a pile of garbage and throw it in. When I threw it in, I noticed a pile of rotten crabs that had been dumped, dumped where I was standing. 
That smell was the worst smell I've ever smelled in my life. And I breathed it in and I almost fainted. I closed my nose and breathed through my mouth, which almost always works, but the smell was so bad that it burned my throat and left a terrible taste in my mouth. Woo, that was a bad. It took a number of hours for the smell to go away. You know what? Anything dead is going to smell awful once it starts to decay. Sometimes the life we have in Christ is very offensive to those who do not want to believe. In fact, they will do anything to get rid of that smell. They will persecute and even kill people who talk about their relationship with Jesus Christ. But there are others who have an open heart and welcome the fragrant life of freedom in Christ. Those who think a true Christian living out his witness in the world stinks like death are very deceived. But we cannot live out our life as a fragrance before God and men without the help of the Lord. We're not equal to that task. Only the Holy Spirit who indwells us. We're not selling a product to the world for money. That is what is so hard for the world to understand. We do what we do because of the free gift given to us. And we pass that along. Those who are in ministry for money are an abomination. And we have a lot of those. We are to speak to men knowing God is watching what we say and what motives we have. And when we witness out of honesty, we're not only a pleasing aroma to God, but we are like men sent from God to those who are looking for an answer. Uh, Jacob often says, we offer what we have for free. I give away a lot of free materials, even books, which cost me a lot of money, usually. Although Moriel has been helping me by printing my books lately. But all of my stuff on DVD is all free on uh, up on YouTube. So we're not in it for the money. <laughs> which is pretty obvious in my case. <laughs> but we're in it to serve the Lord. Whatever we can do to help people, that's what we offer. And we, we try to do so without cost. So um, that's what I have for you today. And it's actually a lot to think about. But uh, hopefully that's that'll be helpful to you.